Welcome everyone. My name is Ian Culbert. I am the Executive Director of the Canadian Public Health Association. I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's webinar. I want to first start by acknowledging that while we're gathering from all parts of Turtle Island, uh, CPHA's offices are located on the ancestral unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg, and we are grateful for their stewardship of the land and the example that they provide to us uh, as uh, in this day and age. So this is our second of four webinars to be offered as part of our Net Zero project that is funded by the McConnell Foundation. This project is being conducted collaboratively by the Canadian Public Health Association, the Canadian Health Association for Sustainability and Equity, and the Ontario Public Health Association. Now I'm going to pass you over to Kim Parada, the Executive Director of CHASE, the, the Canadian Health Association for Sustainability and Health, who will be facilitating today's session. Over to you, Kim. Thanks, Ian. With the Net Zero project, we've been examining the strategies being used by different public health agencies to advance in interventions that can improve population health and reduce health inequities that can also reduce climate emissions. So we're looking for the overlap between those three. Today, we have three speakers, Laura Chow, who is the Senior Planner of the Healthy Environments and Climate Change Team with Vancouver Coastal Health in BC. Sarah Warren, who is the Public Health Promoter with the Climate Change and Health Portfolio with Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit in Ontario. Jay Yeha, who's the former lead of the Healthy Built Environment Program with Island Health in BC, where she was working when I did the interview with her. Um, we would ask you to post any questions that you have on the Q&A module. If you want to introduce yourself and let us know where you're calling in from, please feel free to do so with the chat function. And we will be posting this presentation on the CPHA YouTube um, channel and everyone who registered for the webinar will get be notified when it's been posted. We would appreciate it if you would take a minute at the end of the webinar just to complete our evaluation form because that allows us to make improvements in future webinars, getting your feedback. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass things over to Laura. Hi everybody, just give me two seconds here. Okay, so um, hi everybody. I'm really excited to be here with you today and to present on our experience at Vancouver Coastal Health and working with TransLink and their long range strategic transportation planning for the Metro Vancouver region. Like Ian, I also want to acknowledge that our work here is done on the, I come to you today from the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Muskegon, Squamish, and Tsleil Tooth people. And our work in Vancouver Coastal Health is actually done across the traditional territories of 14 title holding First Nations. And we're really thankful for the opportunity to uh, work in this realm where we impact land land use and um, up work alongside uh, local governments and get to learn how we can advance our own actions around truth and reconciliation. So I'd like to provide you with a little bit of context. In Vancouver Coastal Health, we are one of five regional health authorities across the province of BC, and we serve approximately a quarter of BC's population, which is approximately 1.25 million people. Uh, we have both urban and rural contexts. Uh, we serve 14 different municipalities, some of the most urban, so we serve the city of Vancouver, and some of the more rural uh, municipalities, including Bella Bella, Bella Coola, um, and the, the Powell River and Sunshine Coast. We also serve, fit, uh, our area also covers um, five regional districts and 14 First Nations, as mentioned earlier. Our team with Vancouver Coastal Health is um, has expanded massively. Um, a lot of our team was actually deep in COVID-19 response. And so um, other than our climate change and health lead, Craig Brown, most of us were actually uh, deeply embedded in contact tracing. So uh, as of last fall, we've actually expanded the team to uh, as you see it now, and come September 2023, we will actually be a full complemented team where we have one climate change and health lead who is looking more at climate adaptation measures and what we can do to support our partners and local governments um, to prepare for the impacts that we're, that we're anticipating as a result of climate change. A senior planner and a planner who bring a land use and policy knowledge to uh, process knowledge to the work that we're doing with our partners. 
two environmental health scientists who will come with ex explicit uh, expertise around environmental exposures and their impacts to human health two environmental health officers who come with content expertise around health hazards and their conflicts with land use and um, very good knowledge of the regulatory roles that um, can impact our health and well-being when it comes to environmental exposures and a project coordinator and an analyst who facilitates engagement with partners and has really helped enhance our own commitment to diversity, inclusion, and equity, particularly when it comes to learning about people's learned, uh, lived experiences, especially when it comes to climate adaptation. So if you're familiar with Healthy Built Environment teams, that's the same team that this one uh, was before. Coming out of the pandemic, um, we've actually rebranded our team to Healthy Environments and Climate Change. And that was intentional because we wanted to really emphasize our team's um, thought process around our in innate connection to the impacts of climate change. So this allows us to look at the environmental and physical determinants of health, and we use a very broad adoption of physical hazards. So this allows us to look at how physical hazards, chemical, uh, biological contaminants impact our health and well-being as a result of land use planning. Um, so we also, so this can include land use planning, design, um, and we also look at things like accessibility. We also look at climate mitigation, and I think that that's just inherent when it comes to talking about healthy built environments. Um, we're looking at compact, complete, connected communities, which is really the bare essence of trying to get down to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. We're also working on climate adaptation because we know that there's a lot of things that we need to prepare for and we haven't quite made it there. We know that there's a lot of work to do. So we do a lot of work on extreme temperatures. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on heat um, and we're expanding our work on cold and fall weather uh, adaptations because we're we know that we're also expecting some extreme cold weather that we haven't really anticipated before um, wildfire smoke exposures and what we're going to do in severe weather events such as storms extreme rain rainfall flooding etc our work in Vancouver coastal health uh, has five sort of key approaches firstly we want to bring attention to emerging environmental health issues and solutions so one of the areas that we've been working on quite a bit recently has been traffic related air pollution. So building mass density along major roadways. We know that we need increased density, but what are ways that we can reduce our exposures through mitigation options? We provide feedback and engagement processes and propose plans and policies. Um, and so that's any engagement process that might be open to the public that we're invited to participate in uh, with a local government or other body. We share public health evidence and data to influence or inform policy to help shape the direction that a policy might take. We work on joint projects and issues with community organizations, local governments, and other public health teams, sometimes to try to fill gaps and identify new solutions. Um, so for example, we're working with the city of Vancouver, the district of North Van, and the city of North Van to identify ways to enable cooling in existing buildings, for example. And we also write letters that present to decision-making bodies. And you'll see an example of that as I talk about Transport 2050. So let's talk about Transport 2050. Again, I will provide you with a little bit of context. Uh, TransLink is the regional public transit agency for Metro Vancouver, which consists of 23 local governments. They're governed by a board of directors and the mayor's council. The, mayor, the board of directors covers operations, long-term strategies, investment plans, and the mayor's council will approve these strategies, plans, and processes as they're presented by the mayor's council. Every five to 10 years, a regional transportation strategy is revised or updated, and they wanna make sure that they're ensuring that they're meeting the needs in the region and setting targets and priorities for the region's investments, especially as growth happens across the region quite uh, rapidly and can be uh, very, can change the landscape quite quickly. Transport 2050 was a major overhaul to uh, Transport 2040, which was written in 2008. And the main objective to, was to um, enhance what was already in Transport 2040 because Transport 2040's main objectives, except for one policy, had already been implemented. 
And so Translink came in with a really uh, focused vision for Transport 2050, really advancing and including equity and inclusion in um, their vision statement, and that's stated below. In 2050, everyone can easily connect to the people, places, and opportunities that they need that they, sorry, that they need to thrive because we all have real choices that we can count on, that we can afford, and that we can safely enjoy for generations to come. Our transportation system supports an inclusive, future-friendly region that has meaningfully advanced re reconciliation. As many of you know, there's a lot of health benefits to public transportation investment. Firstly, it reduces greenhouse gas emissions. It enables improved air quality. It improves social equity by enhancing accessibility and promoting independence. It improves physical and mental well-being, from physical activity to social connections, um, enabling people to get out and uh, see people and take part in um, daily life. It improves road safety, and it's a form of sustainable active transportation. In VCH, we participated in this process as an engaged stakeholder. So we were invited to the process and we really relied on our historic relationships. Um, in 2015, Vancouver Coastal Health and Fraser Health took a really strong stance around supporting a transit referendum on funding. And we utilized these uh, relationships to help advance the knowledge around how the health co-benefits to supporting active transportation. This allowed us to have a dialogue around the vision, objectives, goals, indicators, and the integration of a health perspective into Transport 2050. And this allowed us to have many opportunities to review and provide feedbacks on drafts. And ultimately, what we wanted to do was make sure that we were showing up to illustrate that we fully supported the strategy. So we followed up with our partners and said, what do you need to get this strategy approved? and they asked for us to present to the mayor's council. And so we did, which was a uh, success because it ended up going through unanimously. Many lessons learned through this process. Among the first is that we had a really, uh, quite a few challenges through this process. We had quite a lengthy process. It's many years long, which actually probably enhanced the uh, challenges that we had within VCH because we had a rotating door of key contacts that only got worse once COVID hit. We also struggled because public health is still new in a lot of these conversations and to find the right place for our involvement was um, in the processes that they have was a little bit challenging. And it was important for us to try to understand where their processes were. For example, if we got a draft, was this the last time we were going to see a draft? Were we going to be able to comment on a new copy? Um, how would we make sure that the health perspective was included in um, iterations to come? And then, of course, the COVID-19 public health response made our participation quite challenging in this process. Looking forward and thinking about re-engaging in a process like this or something similar, I think there's three key lessons. One really stressing the importance of our relationships, wanting to make sure that we're prioritizing how we work together and what our future relationship might look like. How do we want to work, follow the processes that they have, and ask questions about how they want to go about it, what's the intention of the goals that they're trying to reach, and don't come across as sort of saying, well, why are you doing it like that? Because that's probably not going to get you very far in a relationship building capacity. And remember that you want to work together in the future and think about how you want that to happen. Ideally, it's an organic way where they're inviting you to participate in the process and you really want to, they want you there. It's also really helpful to provide some clarity around what health's added value is to the process. We found that it was really helpful because politicians still very much value public health's perspective. And it can be really helpful for us to ensure that we're on top of their thoughts and considerations um, and know that we're speaking to the right audience. We wanna make sure that we're understanding their processes and then accept that they're not our processes. We wanna approach these with humility and remember that their priorities are completely different from us. Um, and they have a lot of different interests, 23 different local governments. And that's it. Perfect timing. <laughs> right, right on the nose. Thank you so much, Laura. That was excellent. It's really nice summary of the work you guys are doing and, and uh, 
incredible timing. So thank you very much. So we're going to turn things over to you now, Sarah. Excellent. Just one moment as I get the slide up and my screen sorted. All right. I think you can see that now. Yeah, great. Okay, so thank you for having me here today. Um, and today I'll share a little bit about Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit's journey doing climate health work and some key pieces that have helped us build readiness and capacity within our agency and community to foster healthy, equitable, and climate friendly communities. So for some context, we are a local public health unit that reports to an independent board of health, and we are located in central Ontario, just north of Toronto. We are responsible for delivering public health services to residents and visitors of a vast geographic region, which includes urban, suburban, and rural communities. And we serve 26 different municipalities. Um, and a growing population, a quickly growing population of over 540,000. And we also serve four distinct First Nations communities and diverse urban First Nation Inuit and Métis populations. So the inception of SMDHU's climate health portfolio was really influenced by staff's experience working on the built environment and healthy community design. So through this, these experiences, uh, the staff recognized that climate change is a public health issue and that there were synergies with the built environment. And I think Laura did um, a really nice, she touched on that. Um, and so staff advocated to the agency to be involved with climate health work and to put forward climate change to be considered as a priority issue. And through staff advocacy, executive support was gained and climate change was recognized as a priority public health issue in the 2012 and 20, 2012 to 2016 strategic plan. Um, and this helped to build capacity within our agency. So the strategic plan really created this incubation period where resources and learning and engagement was really channeled into developing and implementing a climate change action plan. And so the action plan had two phases. The first was uh, to assess local impacts on climate change and health and identify populations at most risk. Uh, so that our key deliverable here was the climate change and health vulnerabilities assessment. And then the second phase was about integrating those vulnerability assessment findings and the lessons learned from doing it um, to support climate action and climate resilient communities. So there's two key strategies here, which was knowledge translation and stakeholder engagement and health promotion. And so um, the strategic plan and action plan have now been sunset, but climate health work has been embedded into operational planning of our agency. And the climate health portfolio sits within our healthy environments and vector borne disease team. So the theory of change that was developed as part of the phase two, which is illustrated on the screen, has three broad strategies. And up until now, it has guided our climate health portfolio. Uh, for example, it has helped with decision making and prioritizing activities that we can pursue with limited resources. So for this work to be effective and impactful, we have and continue to engage with a variety of actors. Uh, so we engage with our internal staff, management and executives so that they can recognize health and equity risks of climate change, how their work is related to climate change and how their portfolios can more explicitly and effectively address climate change and the associated health and equity impacts. So staff were engaged to inform the action plan and associated activities that uh, we've covered, such as the steering committee, there were four working groups and program teams actually informed the VA. Uh, after the VA, there was communication and application of VA findings. So management um, had sessions, there were working group and in services with various programs. However, this got interrupted by the pandemic. Uh, and now we are starting to re-engage with programs to really integrate a climate health lens across our agency. And we see now as a really big opportunity because uh, our programs are sort of regrouping and reassessing their approaches as the pandemic becomes more routine. 
We also engage with external public health um, to learn from and also to share our knowledge and experience. And the purpose of this is really to inform and advance public health practice regarding climate health programs, but also to reduce duplication of effort. So um, part of our knowledge translation strategy with that phase two of the action plan um, was really targeting public health professionals to share our experience in doing the vulnerabilities assessment um, as others were beginning to do that work. Um, and we continue to learn from and engage with external partners to share other projects we've been working on. So for example, um, in 20, last year we shared our 2021 Lyme disease awareness campaign with our neighboring health units. Um, and sooner than or later, then we're going to need to redo our vulnerabilities assessment and we're going to look to others who have more recently completed theirs for lessons learned. So this is important because there's always evolving tools, um, there's new staff involved with this work. So we really need to, as a public health community, um, continue to share these, these knowledges and work together. And then we engage with municipal and community partners. Uh, part of this is because we really need strong intersectoral collaboration for climate action to effectively reduce the health and equity impacts of climate change. So we've done this in a number of ways, including a GIS story map, uh, presentations, we review policies, provide feedback to different policies, um, and are often members of advisory committees for community greenhouse gas um, action plans or adaptation plans. Um, and we have a climate change exchange, which I'll touch on shortly as well. So this is uh, the climate change exchange. It is one engagement tool that my colleagues created. It is a tabletop exercise that promotes discussion about climate risks and vulnerability to help um, people understand why certain groups or individuals are more at risk to climate health impacts. Um, and it helps them to consider uh, strategies to reduce vulnerability. So it's really linking to the determinants of health. And there's three scenarios that can be played out. Uh, that includes severe winter storms, drought, and extreme heat. And each uh, participant will get a character profile, and each character will have a different number of resource or vulnerability cards. And this is also available in French, thanks to um, some translation help from Health Canada. Our Climate Change Exchange is a regional collaborative network that supports local climate change action. And it was initiated um, to address an identified need for local information exchange and collaboration, particularly because we're not built into one regional or municipal government structure. Uh, so it provides um, collaboration, knowledge exchange, and resource sharing, and assists with capacity building and uh, efficient use of resources within our region to support local climate action. Uh, so we have about 40 members now of municipal and local organizational partners. Um, these include conservation and watershed based management authorities, school boards, uh, among others. So we have quarterly meetings where we have presentations, roundtables, and discussions. We've collectively created a climate change charter, and it has also allowed for peer-to-peer -peer mentoring um, and really created a network of allies and relationships, which are so important to our work in this in our region. SMDHU has also collaborated with Indigenous partners, mostly First Nations, um, on several projects that support climate resilience. And what's really important to recognize is that our team um, took responsibility even before this was an opportunity to understand and learn about Indigenous contexts and health concerns and ways to meaningfully engage. So we didn't go into these um, projects without a baseline of understanding. By no means are we experts and we are continuously learning. Um, another really important thing is that this work cannot be done without building trusting, reciprocal, and respectful relationships. Uh, for us, this has started with one relationship with Cambium Indigenous Professional Services, or CIPS, uh, specifically Carrie Ann Charles Norris. Um, and through this relationship, we've been able to be involved with various successful projects and create new uh, relationships with other partners. 
So our projects have been really, they've happened organically, uh, building from past work and the relationships that we've built. So one of the first projects that we were engaged with, um, SNDHU was one of several health units that supported community-led climate adaptation plans focused on climate health issues. Uh, so five different First Nations communities uh, researched and developed their own adaptation plans utilizing, utilizing traditional ecological knowledge. Um, and we just were there as a stakeholder, as a partner as needed. Um, and from this, our safe water program really collaborated with Beausoleil First Nations to develop a water curriculum for school children, um, which included traditional ecological knowledge. We were also collaborated on a knowledge synthesis project uh, where CIPS again led a, a specific module on um, what public health needs to know about an introduction to Indigenous concepts for us to uh, work together on these things. Um, and then SNDHU is on a learning journey and we're collaborating with various Indigenous communities and organizations to achieve full and meaningful engagement. So in 20, this year, 2023, um, we're evolving our approach. Um, there, as I mentioned, an unprecedented opportunity where we see both opportunity and appetite for change. Uh, this is partly because of the pandemic. Um, and otherwise, we simply just need to evolve to be current, to integrate emerging evidence and foster greater understanding, to be a leader, uh, to respond to those calls of action for public health, to be really a key uh, partner in climate action, to um, capitalize on the health co-benefits and help avoid unintended consequences and maladaptation. And to do that, we need to build capacity and leadership within our system, within our public health systems and agencies. And we also need to be bold to reflect the urgency and scale of climate change to protect health and well-being. Um, and so our evolving approach is really aligned with our past work with calls to action from WHO, the Lancet, IPCC, and Dr. Tam's most recent report um, with our partners, uh, as well as core public health functions. This is my last slide. Um, and here is a glimpse of our proposed evolving approach. Um, so to the left, these are some core roles that we see SNDHU should be engaged in to support climate adaptation and mitigation. And we feel that we need to be um, influencing climate action both internally and externally uh, to support health and well-being. And uh, Right, so our overall goal has stayed the same uh, for communities to be resilient to and have reduced negative health outcomes and inequities associated with climate change. And our objective is that um, we can really integrate a climate health lens and achieve mainstreaming of climate mitigation and adaptation within SNDHU, but also within our with our external partners. Um, so that health is, is centered within climate action. So this is really what we are pursuing um, now and into the future, and this will guide our work. Uh, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. That was really wonderful. And again, it's just um, two health units that are really doing fabulous work and really nice summary. We are going to turn it over to you, Jade, and uh, thank you. Hello. Um, good morning to some and good afternoon to others. I'm just going to get my uh, screens ready to go here. And I hope you're seeing my slides there successfully. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jade Yahia. Um, really a pleasure and honor to be able to be with you today and with this esteemed panel. Um, to, to share a little bit about my previous work um, uh, with Island Health and the past regional built environment consultant um, with the organization. Um, calling in and uh, joining you all and, and grateful to live on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen and Wasenek peoples of the Coast Salish Nation. 
Um, just to give you kind of a little, little, little bit of the lay of the land um, within Island Health of where I used to work and play. Um, there are presently 50 First Nations um, in the Island Health Service area belonging to three First Nations uh, cultural families, generally grouped by language of the Coast Salish, uh, New Chelneth, Kawakwa um, uh, nations. Uh, as well, there are six uh, Métis charter communities within the Island Health region. So Vancouver Island uh, is home to about 900,000 people, um, surrounded by the Pacific Ocean on the West Coast, uh, in the Strait of Georgia, and the Queen Charlotte Strait on the East. It really has a quite rugged geography with many coastal towns. Um, as mentioned, a large number of First Nations communities and several uh, cities and urban centers, including Victoria, which many of you know, um, where I am calling it from, uh, Nanaimo and Campbell River. Um, and geographically, we cover about 56,000 uh, 56, square kilometers. So um, I know it says on my on my title there, I am a human geographer, but uh, I am also an environmental health officer uh, by trade and background. Uh, so I wanted to share a little bit about my professional practice. Uh, like Laura, a background is as being an EHO, um, and I uh, wanted to highlight a couple of uh, statements from our Canadian Institute of Public Health inspectors on their landing page. Um, really, uh, you know, through uh, the work that we do as EHOs, we, um, our main objective is uh, we protect the health of all Canadians. And directly under that, it defines that there's, there's the question posed, what is environmental public health? Um, the answer is really defined as part of a shared goal of supporting the health and safety of all people. Environmental health, uh, public health uh, professionals encompass every aspect of our lives, uh, from air to water to food to employment to recreation to our homes and families, and, and really sounds like healthy communities to me. Um, but I will say, you know, blending uh, my backgrounds and disciplines in human geography and, and environmental health, um, my professional personal passion is lies more in taking the pulse of, of the population or temperature of the population. Um, for almost a decade, I led Island Health's Healthy Built Environment program, which was nested in the Environmental Health Department on the island. And the focus of the team was working in upstream um, health, promoting ways to connect land use planning to health. So there was several layers to the healthy and still is the, uh, to the healthy built environment portfolio. Um, there are staff working uh, with provincial agencies um, who are preparing policy positions and resources. Um, one that you may, may be familiar with the healthy built environment linkages toolkit uh, to support the regional health authorities, Island Health being one of those regional health authorities. Within Island Health, I liaise and connected extensively with our medical health officers. Uh, I saw one on the call. Hello, Mike. <laughs> uh, as well as many other team members in environmental health, uh, population health with respect to aggregated community health data and operational strategic planning folks that really help to give those sight lines um, into other priorities of the organization. Specific to my immediate department, um, there are uh, one and a half uh, full-time staff, uh, I being one of them, and I had a lovely colleague who worked in the North Island as well. And we focused on building capacity in uh, healthy built environments across the health authority. In particular, uh, we provided support to staff working in the field. And my job was to develop internal capacity within environmental health officers in the topic of healthy built environments. We encourage those staff, the EHOs, to move beyond those regulatory roles in the space of healthy built environments and be inclusive of best practice considerations to work directly with municipal planners, community organizations, health networks or tables so that they can engage directly with those people that are impacted by land use decisions in their communities. Um, as many of you know on this webinar, I'm sure that um, the places that we live, play, work, thrive, heal, connect, and be safe um, have such a profound impact on our health and well-being. Um, and how that built environment is planned, designed, and organized really um, is, is critical to, to our health. Um, I just uh, wanted to acknowledge uh, the, the image there on the screen, the Healthy Built Environment Training for Health Professionals, uh, a really wonderful landing page that was actually a provincial effort. I was involved as well as um, colleagues from Laura's team um, and, and, and to 
try and uh, create a consistent uh, approach to our um, a professional practice and really uh, grow awareness within EHOs and other health professionals doing healthy built environment work. And this is a public resource um, for those that want to check it out after. Let's show you on my slide. So it's some lovely animations of feet that are not complying with me right now. So <laughs> um, I wanted to dig deeper into a couple of uh, case examples, uh, one being uh, the Cowichan Airshed Roundtable. Um, so this is, is one area on Vancouver Island, the Cowichan Valley Regional District, home to uh, approximately 80 3,000 people. It sits right between um, Nanaimo and Victoria on Vancouver Island and is home um, to the communities of Duncan, Ladysmith, Shimanus, North Cowichan, and Cowichan tribes, um, BC's largest First Nations band, and several other First Nations community. So uh, there was a, a great uh, effort by our medical health officer, as well as Ministry of Environment, um, and many partners starting to come together and recognize uh, there was a, quite a significant issue on of air quality concerns within um, the valley. Couch and Valley is, is prone to those inversion layers. Um, and as such, uh, Ministry of Environment uh, did a, conducted an emissions inventory in 2014 and estimated that 77% of the total particulate, fine particulate matter in the region is coming from open burning sources, um, as well as uh, wood stoves. So, um, and, and then uh, our medical health officer dug into some of the, um, you know, in those connections with Ministry of Environment, I dug into our local health area profile data and indicated that emission rates for children um, with respiratory diseases average 70% higher than provincial averages um, over a period of, of 1998 to 2012. Um, in fact, actually, they saw a higher uh, rates of uh, diagno those diagnosed with asthma, 17% higher, um, as well as uh, uh, COPD, seeing higher rates in that uh, domain as well. So the CVRD, the Cowichan Valley Regional District, took a leadership role in the development of an airshed strategy to address uh, these emissions that they were um, finding, as well as the, the health concerns within the valley. Um, you know, given the area has so many uh, different players, as many uh, areas and regions have, they took uh, a lead role in, in bringing together those partners through this airshed uh, roundtable and taking that uh, collective impact approach to their efforts. Um, so I was part of this uh, this uh, unfolding and through uh, using a collective impact or a community based approach, uh, the leadership team developed um, simple rules to for us to come together because there was a variety of different competing interests. Um, however, the one um, kind of rooted and, and foundation to the airshed strategy was to protect human health. So we would always come together reaffirming our trust, um, being transparent about our interests and agendas, falling forward and taking risks together and creating a space for vitality and fun um, as best as we could. And, uh, um, you know, many participants uh, found this to be a really uh, effective model um, for shared leadership. There were, once the strategy was developed back in 2015, there were key priorities for implementation. So education and awareness uh, was a working group that uh, was formed out of this overarching structure. One uh, to address open burning uh, and bylaw implementation, um, as well as uh, data monitoring and evaluation. And that was based on uh, Ministry of Environment monitors, uh, citizen science, air, air quality monitors deployed in the community, as well as um, from the health uh, side of things, um, keeping uh, taking stock and keeping track of the health data and sharing that within the community and public. Um, I, I just also wanted to speak to, uh, thank you, Kim, that uh, within the Couch and Airshed Roundtable, there was a, a great deal of effort as well around uh, heat pumps and uh, promoting uh, the use of heat pumps uh, to, to address wood stove exchange. 
So um, this uh, landing page here, uh, the YouTube link there uh, on the slide is actually a, a wonderful video that Ministry of Environment uh, partners within the uh, Couch and Airshed Roundtable, uh, citizens in the community, as well as our medical health officer brought some of this data to life and is an engagement tool um, to promote the uh, colossal efforts in the region to uh, get folks off of wood stoves, inefficient wood stoves, educate them on and how to burn better and cleaner, and even more so really a huge incentive programs uh, encouraging uh, switching completely off of wood stoves and moving towards heat pumps. I just wanted to share quickly uh, another example of some of the work that the Healthy Built Environment team did um, was around the Township of Esquimalt Official Community Plan Review. Um, this is a community adjacent uh, to Victoria that was facing a lot of development pressure. Um, and as such, there was a, a, a lot of interest from the land use planners and the municipality to promote uh, the missing middle um, and address uh, you know, gaps in housing stock. As they were doing this, they really also wanted to promote uh, social well-being, and uh, which is, of course, connected to our, our resilience as individuals and community. Um, so we worked uh, through the OCP review to promote aspects of social well-being, but then also helped with the implementation of, of some of those um, policy efforts uh, by the township. So uh, working with um, uh, partners to uh, secure some grants um, and doing uh, some community engagement within the community on how to best uh, promote social well-being. So I'll just wrap by saying, I know this is a uh, lot to distill in a, in a short amount of time, but there was a great amount of lessons learned within this work. Um, our medical health officers being uh, such huge champions to our Healthy Built Environment Program. We really found over time as we evolved within the HBE pro, uh, portfolio and team that it was less so of just, um, you know, uh, land use planning, um, it, you know, finding like, as Laura said, those adequate insertion points, but getting involved early on in committees and helping with the implementation of the work um, once those policies have been formed within official community plans or master plans. Um, aligning with uh, the priorities of the communities, the context being really key on their unique challenges. And um, as, as public health professionals, to be um, an educator, an advocate, an ally, a trusted voice and partner, and uh, really bringing our evidence and, and data-driven uh, information uh, to the table. And with that, I will pass it on over to Kim. Thank you very much. Kim, you're on mute. Thank you very much, Jade. That was excellent. And I really appreciate all three of you covering a lot of material in very short time. But I think that gives people a nice overview. And um, we'll see what questions we have and see if we can kind of draw out any more information from all of you. So um, the first one is kind of a small one, but um, somebody is asking if... Um, for you, Sarah, if the climate change game is online, and I'll just add to that, I was also wondering kind of the intended audience, was it intended for something that could be used by the community or for capacity building? I was just kind of curious. Yeah, so it's not online. Um, it, it kind of is a card game more or less that you that you would discuss on a table or around a table. Um, and the intended audience is really other public health staff within your agency or like community members, uh, municipal community partners, particularly, uh, to really try to communicate vulnerability and, and why certain individuals or groups are made more vulnerable from the determinants of health. Okay, thank you. And then um, I've got a question here from Raluca Radu um, for Jade, um, Jade, what are some of the key lessons, takeaways around building capacity for those working in the field? What challenges did you come across and how did you overcome them? So I know it's, that's kind of complex, but maybe like a shorter version of the, the, the big question. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, and hello, Rilika. Um, I, great question. I would say, um, you know, while I was speaking to my perspective, as a the healthy built environment, um, you know, consultant for the organization, really uh, 
uh, looking deeper into this kind of collective impact model we found to be quite helpful and um you know, with it, within Island Health, that we have a number of community health networks that are are adopting this model to and have adopted this model for for some time now to really mobilize and catalyze action um, within the community. And why I'm kind of speaking to that is that um, well, I was but one part of this puzzle. There was huge community champions that were involved, as well as uh, researchers. Um, different uh, people speaking to their unique perspectives within their communities. So I think we are all seasoned experts um, and we know our neighborhoods quite well. So um, I guess uh, to distill it simply is really um, speaking your voice, um, helping to inform on what you're seeing in your built environment and, and helping to champion the work um, is uh, what I would advise for, for other uh, practitioners in this field. Thank you. And then um, can I just ask Ian, um, I've not been following the chat. Are there any questions in the chat that um, you've seen that we should bring forward? There is one question from Christine. Uh, what resources organizations do you base your climate forecasting for specific communities on? And was that directed to anybody in particular or no? It was not. Which one of the three of you would anybody like to jump in on that one? Maybe not, uh, Laura or Sarah. I can speak okay. a little bit to uh, the Vancouver Coastal Health uh, perspective. We haven't done our own forecasting. Um, a lot of it's really needing to stay on top of um, existing reports and other experts. Uh, we don't have like a climate meteorologist on staff. Um, so Metro Vancouver did some forecasting back in 2016, which is probably a little bit old now. Um, and we've been working with the province to try to figure out how they can improve their flood mapping, for example, across the province, uh, because that's a gap. So we've been kind of identifying as, I mean, 2021 was such a great example of where forecasting, climate forecasting actually didn't forecast what we saw on the ground and just how much work we need to do to try to better understand um, the climate models and get a better sense of what are the risks. And um, generally, I would say from a public health perspective, I don't know that we need to know the explicit um, exact outcomes, we know that these risks are increasing and that's sort of good enough. We know that heat's gonna be an ongoing issue. We know that wildfires are going to continue to be a massive issue. Um, we're getting a better sense of identifying what our indicators are to watch for. So for example, like we know that watersheds are running short of water and so we need to find, and and so we're trying to focus more on like, what is what can we do about what we already know versus trying to focus on like, just how bad is it going to be? Because maybe it doesn't matter. It's more about ensuring that people have the resiliency and the tools to try to handle as much as they possibly can. Um, and we can help them with that process. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to just say, if like, you know, if there's other people who have questions, please put them in the Q&A. And, but just in the meantime, um, I thought for Sarah, you go have folks did some really nice work around the healthy built environment policies because you work with so many different municipalities and that. And I understand that you updated, um, you updated those recently, but you also did your indigenous, your first nations policy lens. And I wonder if you wanna just tell a little bit about that project a, a little bit more, and then maybe what you are hoping or intending to do with that piece. Yeah, so I think those are two uh, separate things. So before my involvement or before I was with SNDHU, um, there was a development of sort of these public policy or operation planning statements to support inclusion of variety of health issues um, related to the built environment. So it includes like safe roads um, and more recently it was updated to include statements that reflect climate action. Uh, so again, strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and include um, or improve air quality. So those statements are included in that policy statement document and that helps um, both our, our staff 
who are doing reviews of planning documents, um, but also the urban planners in our region. However, we've sort of started to move away from that because um, our programs have really built a strong relationship with our urban planners um, and the urban planners now sort of get it and understand that climate health connection as well, or that health connection with um, healthy environments and built environments. Um, the other piece you were referring to, I believe, is the knowledge synthesis project. Um, so we did a knowledge synthesis project, which aimed to capture a variety of characteristics of climate health adaptation projects. Um, we did that in collaboration with the Public Health Agency of Canada and CIPS or Cambium Indigenous Professional Services. Um, and CIPS did a module two. Um, so they led that module and it was all about why Indigenous voices are so essential in climate health adaptation planning um, and, and introduced critical concepts um, that public health authorities and individuals doing this work needs to understand and meaningfully apply um, for that climate health let, or for that indigenous lens and voice to be included in this work. Um, and it is really essential. So that's really a resource for a starting point um, to become familiar with some of these issues and topics. It is by no means an end point. Um, and maybe I can answer the, the last question a little bit about um, climate forecasts. So our health unit completed the climate change and health vulnerabilities assessment in 2017. So that included general climate um, projections for our region as best as we could with the data available at that time. Um, and then we also have continuous monitoring and surveillance of, of specific things like extreme heat, extreme cold, vector-borne disease, air quality. Um, and then we we'll also rely a lot on, on lit emerging literature as well. Thank you very much. We have another question from Penelope Kuhn. Um, did any of you face internal challenges getting support for your work from your management? So I don't know if, um, I, I think for the three of you probably come from, kind of probably there was fairly strong support, but maybe do any of you kind of feel like you'd like to weigh in and maybe um, if there weren't internal challenges, maybe what you feel was important in your public health unit that helped this to happen? Like what were some of the, you know, was there somebody that was really kind of pushing for this internally or was there a strong support at, at an executive level? So just any comments that you might have. Anybody want to jump in there? <laughs> I, I can try. So I, I think uh, since I've been at the agency, there has been support for this work. Um, and my understanding is that this work started from the staff recognition and advocacy to, to our executives. Um, and so that was really important. But I think highlighting to others in the agency that this work is already happening. Your organizations are already doing extreme heat work. They're already doing vector-borne disease work. They're already doing social determinants of health work. All of this is related to increasing resilience to climate change and addressing climate health impacts. So we're already doing the work. Let's just make it more explicit and intentional to um, respond to the calls to action and evidence that we're seeing every week come out. Thank you. And Laura or uh, Jade, would you guys like to add anything to that? Go ahead, Jade. I, yeah, thanks. I, I guess I would just say, um, you know, being that this uh, portfolio and work was nested in environmental health protection, um, you know, and EHOs, they have competing priorities and, and uh, issues, uh, you know, they have to address health hazards, as, as Laura was speaking to, they also are in charge with, um, you know, the Public Health Act, the Drinking Water Protection Act, um, and compliance with a variety of different pieces of legislation. So, 
The big challenge um, would be is if there is an immediate issue in the community, COVID-19 being an immediate pressing issue, that was deploying uh, efforts uh, to address those health hazards in our community. Some of this upstream work around land use planning, you know, is is it takes time, it takes relationships, um, and and so I think just. Uh, reinforcing how uh, we need to do this and um, with this work. Um, the MHOs, I can't sing their praises enough. The medical health officers, they are huge champions. They really were the, the impetus of, of why the program um, get, it got up and up off the ground in the first place. So again, I tip my hat to them. Uh, so huge champions there. Um, and lastly, I would just say communities, um, communities coming and asking to have us there. Um, some of the work that I was sharing in Cowichan and, and Esquimalt, it actually continued and we have uh, continued to be involved in actually many of their, their climate action plans, some of their climate, their own uh, climate projection work. Um, so, you know, responding to the call of our communities to be a trusted voice and partner in, in their settings. Yeah. Thank you, Jade. I'm going to switch gears if that's okay. And Laura, I don't know if you wanted to add to that, but I'm going to switch gears because there's another question from Inga Rosendahl, who's in the uh, city of Ottawa. And her question is, and I think it's kind of interesting, has COVID shifted the conversation around dimensions of health equity with urban planners? I think in other words, like have some of the equity issues with COVID kind of made your urban planners that you're dealing with more sensitive to some of the health, health equity issues that you've been raising? Anybody want to take that one on? Laura? <laughs> um, I will say that, you know, in Vancouver Coastal Health, we're quite lucky that we get to work with a lot of really um, aggressive um, municipalities. And because we're, we do cover quite an urban area, um, there's there was quite a call to look at how to include equity into planning processes um, and how different populations are affected long before COVID. Um, and I think COVID just uh, sort of re-emphasized the need for the political side of things. So I think there's from the the planners and the people that we were working with, um, equity's always kind of been embedded and part of the conversation. Um, and it, it's been more about trying to find ways to systemically insert uh, equity in this in a field that can be quite data driven. Um, and especially when it comes to equity, like we, we just don't have a lot of that nuanced data from um, a disaggregated point. But um, I don't think that COVID necessarily changed um, the conversation with the folks that we work with most, it was more um, at the political level and maybe decision maker level where um, it became more prominent um, and recognized that they need to actually address these problems. So it actually probably helped the planners along more than anything. Thank you. Um, do Sarah or Jay, do you want to add to that at all or you're good with that? <laughs> Um, I do have another question here. It's a, a small thing here from um, Judy Stanley is just saying, you know, Sarah, can you share the uh, Indigenous planning resources? I'm trying to remember if it was actually in the blog that you did for us. Do we have a link to it in there? So I'll add it to the chat here. That would be terrific. Okay. And then um, I think there was, I thought I saw something else, but it may have been in chat. Um, Ian, do you have anything else in chat that you'd like to Yes, Kim. Uh, Deanna is asking if Sarah could expand on her point. Was it knowledge synth synthesis with SIPs and FAC, uh, specifically whether those modules are available somewhere we can look at? So I'll add the links to the chat here. Um, so the first module was was with FAC and um, SNDHU, and the second module was commissioned uh, CIPS to lead that. Um, and I'll share those resources here, as well as a journal article that we worked on together. And there's one last question, and we just got a few more minutes here. So um, from Helen Doyle, who was the manager at one time in York Region Health Services, um, are you aware of or seeing an increase in curriculum in public health schools relating to healthy built environments and um, or health climate and health linkages? So I don't know which of you, if any of you want to kind of respond to that. Jade, you're smiling the most, so you might get the question. So do you want to give it a give it a go or are you aware of anything? 
Um, yes, I know I'm smiling. Um, yeah, I, I think stay tuned. I, I think that there'll be, uh, you know, the traveler's journey for a healthy built environment platform there uh, that I shared on the healthy built environment training uh, resources. It's a great place to go to. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that gets a, a revisit um, and an update. I see Laura nodding there. Um, but uh, definitely, I think, uh, you know, within I, I saw for many years it, doing this work, um, you know, using the Healthy Built Environment training platform to, to share with, with MPH students, uh, uh, interns. It was something that I was doing in my professional practice. Uh, uh, I, I believe Laura was also doing it. So um, I think there is definitely an expansion of it. And I'll stop talking now because um, Laura and Sarah might have some other resources they might want to share. Nope. <laughs> I know BCIT has incorporated lots of additional talks around this in their EHO training program. Um, and there's been more interest, I think, from uh, other disciplines, maybe outside of traditional public health that um, are starting to look at having like an invited guest come and present on the association. So for example, I went and presented to an engineering sort of planning and engineering class at UBC last year um, and various opportunities to connect with um, planning as a discipline in their education, but not like as a structured module or anything like that. And I'm afraid we have to stop there. It's one o'clock, but thank you very much. Three wonderful speakers talking about really innovative work that's being done in your public health agencies. Really appreciate you taking the time to do this today and for doing it so concisely. So thanks very much, folks, and thanks for joining us. And just a reminder, if folks could um, take a minute, it will be only a minute to do the evaluation, that would be really appreciated. Thank you very much. <laughs>